Good morning, and welcome to this, the sixth session of Vietnam 20 years after Voices of the War. This is a program for our students and their guests from the campuses of high schools and colleges and universities across the Commonwealth. The rest of us are merely listening in. Our symposium has been made possible in part by a grant from Media General Incorporated in Richmond, Virginia, the parent corporation of the Richmond Times-Dispatch. We also have been significantly assisted by a local donor who prefers to remain anonymous. There's no anonymity in our gratitude to him, however. I hope that you recognize it has been our purpose to expose the full range of views and positions about that conflict we know as the war in Vietnam. Today's session is designed to enlarge that horizon and to cause us to come to grips with some of the profound questions we wrestled with during the 1960s and the 1970s. We are blessed indeed to have, in addition to Professor Crandall, who will be introduced by our moderator, to have two major political figures out of American history to give us their thoughts at the time and now concerning that conflict. I might add that for those of you who have not read it, the speech given by Senator Eugene McCarthy, I believe it was at the Democratic Convention in November 1967, still remains as one of the most powerful and moving political speeches of all time, as far as I'm concerned. It's short, and it's worth your going back and reading it. Because in it, he crisply and profoundly voices the concerns of all those who were deeply worried about the war. Senator McCarthy and Senator McGovern, our gratitude to both of you for being here with us, and that on fairly short notice, is unbounded, sirs, and we are looking forward to our session with you this morning. Now it's my privilege to present to you one of the several most popular professors on the campus here at Hamden Sydney College, Professor of History, Ron Hyman. Good morning. It's uh, nice to see so many of you out at this very early hour of 9.30. The subject of this final session of the symposium, the American Home Front, may be the most important chapter of the war. But the real significance of Vietnam for the United States is what it did to us at home. I read in this morning's paper, General Westmoreland quoted that the Vietnam War will in the future not be perceived as very significant. From a military point of view, that may be true, although I would have a question about that. From the political and social point of view, that will never be true. For this is a war that divided us as no other event since the Civil War, divided us by generation, by family, by politics, gave us bombings and police riots and guardsmen shooting college kids. It disrupted our political order, breaking up the Democratic Party majority. It gave us Richard Nixon and Watergate. And the combination of Vietnam and Watergate then eroded the faith of Americans in their government and their leaders. 
It influenced subsequent foreign policy decisions and the role of the military in our lives. It changed the relationship between the executive and legislative branches. And the lingering fascination for the war in film and literature, the problems of veterans, the issue of the MIAs, not to mention the election of 1992, demonstrate the long-term influence of this event. How did this happen? Very simply, there came to be a disagreement about the war, a disagreement based on moral, legal, political, personal reasons. A protest movement developed whose growth corresponded to the escalation of the war. Now, protest in wartime in America is not unique to Vietnam. It has been visible in all of our wars. But Vietnam produced the most intense and vocal and influential opposition in our history. Some would say that this protest ended the war. Others would say that it cost us the war. Undoubtedly, this protest was heightened by the times. The 60s were tumultuous and rebellious when all kinds of authority were challenged. And the voices against the war were extensions of these times. Our panelists are three distinguished Americans who came to see the war differently from Messrs. Rostow, Colby, and Westmoreland. Senators McCarthy and McGovern need no introduction, particularly to this crowd as I look around and see the gray hairs. Although Senator McCarthy did say that 20, 30 years later, he probably now does need an introduction. <laughs> Un undoubtedly, these are the two best known political opponents of the war both of whom ran for the presidency on anti-war platforms. Dr. William Crandall, writer, lobbyist, was a Vietnam veteran who returned from the war and became a leading figure in the Vietnam veterans against the war. I often tell my students that the courage that I admire most is intellectual courage the fortitude to stand up for what you believe in the face of the crowd, to speak your mind when all about are jeering or are silent. Our panelists demonstrated this courage. They began to condemn the war, to question its rationality when that was not popular, when their patriotism was called into question, when their careers were on the line. They called for America to come home. I thought we might begin this morning by letting each gentleman explain the transformation of how he personally came to oppose the war. With very few exceptions, Americans in the early 60s either applauded the effort to stop communism in Southeast Asia, or they were indifferent to it. Something then happened. So we might begin, gentlemen, what changed your mind? And I think we'll just roll down the panel from me to Senator McGovern. Well, I didn't really change my mind. I hadn't made it up. And having said that, why you really, uh, it's sort of an escape. You can become a historian. You're not morally responsible for anything <laughs> if, if you do that. And I decided early that I would look on this as an historian would and it, it was really not a war that took us by surprise. We were around, and we had a chance to look at it for like 20 years. And you get it, as said to McGovern, say, people say, oh, you were, you were ahead of your time. Nobody was ahead of his time on Vietnam. It was ahead of all of us. Or you say, you're a visionary. This somehow is supposed to explain that you're really a little irresponsible. And that the people who don't agree with you are really responsible. They're kind of normal people. But as it, as it went on, I suppose we started with the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, which took us all by surprise. Uh, and it turned out later we should have been surprised because there really was no Tonkin Gulf incident. 
So you pass a resolution against something that didn't really happen. Uh, you're, you're not really a visionary. You're just being misled. It wasn't that significant. Um, there were two votes against it in the Senate. And uh, the proponents of it seemed to say that if it just had been unanimous, the Vietnamese would never have fought. It was, the balance was that delicate, we were led to believe. And then in 67, we had another vote sort of relative to it, and five people voted against it, in effect. They said, look at that, over a 100% increase in the opposition to the war. It went from two to five, you know, and you could see the Vietnamese trembling at that prospect, saying the opposition has more than doubled in the United States. And we went on to some other things that were supposed to have had uh, a very uh, negative effect on the war. Um, my campaign, uh, uh, the Chicago Convention, uh, Vietnamese would say, well, really the Americans are against this war. Look at what's happening to them in Chicago. And then George's campaign also that sort of uh, kept encouraging the Vietnamese, at least that was the proposition. Well, I began to doubt as we went along, just in a detached way, as to whether the people who were running the war knew what they were doing. And there were two persons principally. Uh, uh, one was Dean Rusk. And in 65, uh, President Johnson uh, had a policy of, of uh, inviting us down to the White House, 10 or 20 members, and he would bring the cabinet in to talk to us about various things. And he used to give, Russ could get 10 minutes and McNamara would get 10 minutes and lesser cabinet members would get five. And he kept the clock on them. And Rusk on this night, it was when we were changing presidents in Vietnam pretty regularly and General Khan was in charge. And someone said to Dean Rusk, um, is this a stable government? He said, oh yes, we really put it together. Uh, we've reconciled the Christians and the Buddhists and the Hindus and everything is solid. I think it was Wednesday night. Friday morning the headlines were that Khan had been thrown out. So you got to wonder on Monday if you have Russ telling you what the situation is in, in, in Vietnam, what's it going to be like on Wednesday? But he went right back as, as the expert on the politics of Vietnam. It was clear that we didn't know what was going on. If we did, we didn't have any control over it. And the second sort of personal observation was with McNamara. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but when he was appointed as Secretary of Defense, uh, they said he made no small mistakes. And all of us were watching him for small mistakes, you know. <laughs> and you should always be suspicious of anyone who makes no small mistakes or who admits that he doesn't or claims that he doesn't. In any case, he was the expert on the military operation. And, uh, well, he, there were some rather simple things earlier when we were really not engaged, but by 1966, we had significant numbers of troops in, and he testified in... It was January, about bombing North Vietnam. And he said, if we bomb, they'll be able to infiltrate and supply up to 4,500 a month. And they talked about eroding action in the South. Well, six months later, he was up, and the report was they were infiltrating 7,000 a month. And I thought it was a significant difference. I said, how do you explain the difference? He said, what difference? I said, well, 4,500 to 7,000. He said, the number they could infiltrate has always been more than 4,500, but it's less than X. And you say, well, that's a pretty good margin of error. I'd say, well, I'd say, uh, and he said, well, with the bombing, he said, uh, there is a ceiling that will be established, and that will be X. And you begin to wonder, you say, somebody in this room is, is a little mixed up. And he had to be either McNamara or me, and I made the hard choice <laughs> that it was he. And it got even worse. You know, he was very specific. Senator Morse one day said, 
I don't know why he asked it. He said, how many fighter planes are there in South America? And McNamara didn't look it up. He said 537. Well, if he said 500 or 600 or something in that range, but why did you ask? And Morse wouldn't have known. But McNamara then said, and that is fewer planes than there are in North Korea. Well, that's a significant relationship. I mean, how many planes are there in North Korea? More than in Latin America. You could see the issue was probably going to be joined very soon. <laughs> and then Morse said, how many tanks are there in Latin America? And McNamara didn't look that up. He said 974. And without another question, he said, McNamara did, and that is 60% as many tanks as a single country Bulgaria has. Now, these are pretty complex relationships. <laughs> Fighter planes in Korea and in Latin America, tanks in Latin America, and tanks in Bulgaria. And I had resolved, after my experience with the X factor, that I would never ask him another question. But this moved me, especially the mention of Bulgaria. And I said, well, I'm interested in that answer, 964. He said, that's right. And I said, but why did you tell us it was 60% of the number in Bulgaria? He said, because it is. And I said, well, I believe that. But I said, why Bulgaria? I said, do you count tanks in your business relative to the number in Bulgaria? I said, is there a kind of a Bulgarian absolute? <laughs> as far as tanks are concerned, and he said, if there were, I would tell you about it. <laughs> well, those were just kind of historical judgments that led me to have grave doubts about both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the general counting of the war. Another aspect of it, which is, again, historical observation, uh, apart from the particular successes, was that if you looked at it, there was a progressive corruption of the military establishment in about four different ways. One was, and they were being asked to do things which were quite foreign and contrary to the American code of military conduct. Uh, My Lai Massacre, for example. Uh, the military was corrupted also either under pressure internal or external to falsify reports. Uh, they were corrupted also in, really, I think, in the sense that they were asked to support a draft program which was essentially dishonest and unfair. Uh, I suppose the manifestation of that was uh, the last campaign we had a Secretary of Defense who had stayed out of the war, although he said he was forward by going to school forever. Uh, you had the president who could never really explain how he stayed out of it. And you had the Vice President Quayle who had taken the worst escape, which was to join the National Guard. Because you were quite sure not to go to war, but you could protect us from internal subversion. And if you recall the Guard functions in those years, the Illinois Guard, its principal act was to patrol the Democratic Convention, which was a dangerous movement. And the Ohio Guard, uh, their principal achievement was to shoot the students at Kent State. So you join the National Guard as a way of avoiding the draft. I was in an antique shop. I don't want to get off on quail, but I was in an antique shop, and they had a poster for sale. It was 1861. It said, avoid the draft, join the Indiana Guard. And they paid you $400 if you had experience and 100 if you hadn't. But it was a 125 years difference in the joining the Indiana Guard was a way to avoid the draft even then. It corrupted, uh, it corrupted the press. Uh, part of that, the press was willing to be corrupted, but they published reports. They didn't publish some reports they should have published. They published some things which they should have known were untrue. I suppose the worst demonstration of that was the New York Times. Um, if you really want to look at a paper that needs to be watched, any, any paper that on its masthead said, we publish all the news that's fit to print, you know they're not honest. 
Well, you start with a masthead declaration of potential hypocrisy. But in March of 1968, the 17th, I think, they had a front page story about how American companies uh, military had surrounded 128 Viet Cong soldiers and held them in a pincer movement while they were killed by helicopter fire. Well, that was really the My Lai Massacre, but the Times presented it as a significant military accomplishment. The corruption of the military, of the press, and willingly accepted. And if you, Jimmy Reston, who um, just has a new book out, the, about every 10 years the Times lets Reston print a book about them. And uh, it's usually an act of uh, sort of examination of conscience. And I hate to say this at a Presbyterian school, but he, Reston is a Presbyterian, and Presbyterians don't really believe in confession. It's between you and God. And the Times lets Reston do this for them. He's the intermediary. <laughs> and he does this about every, they don't have an ombudsman at the Times because it, they don't do anything that needs to be re-examined in the short range. And Reston does this, and, and he gives them kind of a Presbyterian absolution. He said, you fellows are committed no fault, but if you have, God will save you in the end anyway. And on Vietnam, his proposition was sort of that the Times is a patriotic organization. So this tended to justify uh, what, he had, uh, what they had written or what they had not written. And the third area of corruption, again observed in a detached way, was the corruption of language and of communication. And it started out sort of with the Orwellian Latinization. And, uh, um, I think I heard the general last night talk about pacification, which is one of the Orwell words, rectification of boundaries, Vietnamization, which Orwell said, if you, once you start using Latin words, beware. He said, it's like snow covering an obscene landscape. And that was there. But they went on from that to uh, something that was new in communications to present war in quantitative terms. First they had the body count, which was, a, was at least a real count if it was properly reported. So, so many people were killed. Uh, and they developed comparative standards. So they would say, well, there were 50 or 500 killed last month, but that was fewer people than were killed on the highways. So as long as you could keep the deaths in Vietnam lower than those on the highways, why supposedly it was all right. I mean, this, this was the measure. So then they moved from that, the numbers got too high. It was a little like dealing with the nuclear bombs they, and out, atomic bombs. They started out saying, well, this bomb is the equivalent of 20 Hiroshima's. But when you got to 100 Hiroshima's, people said, well, where, where did they all come from? You know, you can only have so many Hiroshima's. So they then switched to Greek, and they began to talk about kilotons. So that reduced the prime number. And the kilotons got too high for people to comprehend, so they shifted to megatons. So you could reduce kilotons from 1,000 to 1, just one change of language. And in the case of Vietnam, they went to the kill ratio. It wasn't how many were killed, it was the ratio of our numbers that were killed to theirs, and at some point uh, they developed the absolute standard, which was that if the ratio was 12 to 4, 12 of them to 4 of us, that this was a standoff. But if we could get it to where we killed 12 of them for every 3 of ours that were killed, we were winning the war. But if it went to 12 to 5, we were losing. And this was a magic division, it's sort of sustained by IBM. And IBM said this is the way it works out. You just put it through the computer and 12 to 4 is absolute zero and 12 to 5 is defeat and 12 to 3 means victory. And finally they went to changing words in a way altogether, giving them a new meaning. And I'll just give one more and then get on to other people's presentation. But I thought it was significant when Nixon took over they introduced a word that was new in American history, these military annals, something called the incursion. 
We had never conducted an incursion before in our whole history. In fact, you really can't conduct an incursion because there's no verb. You can't incurse. You can invade, you know, and that's a positive act of will, but an incursion is a kind of happening. It said, who's responsible? You say, an incursion it just, just occurred. And this is sort of what we, the attitude in which the war was presented. It's an incursion, at least in, in, in Cambodia. And that's sort of where we left it. And I uh, make one, one of the, I think, significant comments about the war was a Vietnam veteran who was at the, the memorial. And he said, this is a strange memorial. He said, it's like the war. He said, it has no beginning and it has no ending. Thank you, Senator. Dr. Brannell. I never dreamed that I would oppose my country. Um, not something that a, a kid growing up, a Republican in Ohio, uh, imagined doing much. Um, I became a Kennedy Democrat when I was in college, and I volunteered for Vietnam. Uh, I had an infantry commission from ROTC. And I had studied a lot about the war because I was fascinated with President Kennedy, and he was fascinated with Vietnam. And after his death, I felt somehow I've got to help. So I went. Uh, I, I can remember calling the Pentagon and asking if you could, could you use another infantry lieutenant in Vietnam. They said, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I asked if I could get into uh, jump school and ranger school and special forces and they said, I can give you jump school and we can definitely promise you Vietnam. I had the good fortune to be with a unit the 199th Infantry Brigade when it was formed. Um, one of the things that I think most of the veterans of the war have learned is that one of the many ways we did it wrong was to keep units in place and swap men and destroy the cohesion of fighting organizations. Um, I went with a pretty good unit that we knew who we were, even knowing who you couldn't trust gave you a factor of trust, because you knew it. So I, I did the various things that we were supposed to do. Um, I was on a number of patrols where some of them went through free fire zones. They were enemy territory. Anybody we saw was the enemy. So I have shot at people because I could tell they were people. Couldn't tell at that distance whether they were farming, carrying rifles, or anything else. We conducted ambushes to make the, the area secure. Um, one morning just at dawn, we killed three men leaving a village. I believe they were Viet Cong, although it's possible that they were fishermen. They were in a boat. We never found their bodies. They were from that village. We killed them for going home, basically. By the time I came home from Vietnam at the end of 1967, I was discouraged, but I still supported the war. I thought it was going to take a lot longer than, uh, than we hoped. But we'd win it, because we win wars. So I was in a living room in Columbus, Ohio during the Tet Offensive, and I, I had therefore one of the better points of view. I watched it on television. And I could see that although our whole strategy had been based on convincing the Vietnamese that we could protect them and they could be loyal to us, that every place we protected was overrun, however temporarily. Even the American Embassy was overrun. And that important major political connection for the Vietnamese 
had to be a terrible American defeat. And I heard our commanders on television and our politicians saying this was a fantastic victory because we killed so many of them. And I turned to my roommate and I said, we're going to lose this war because the men who are running it don't understand what it's about. And that means that everybody who dies from now on is wasted. And then I stopped because the next sentence was very hard. That means that everybody who's already dead was wasted. That was hard for me because I had still friends over there. And about that time I heard of an organization, I think there were a couple dozen guys in it called Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I wrote in and I said I want to join because I had friends I wanted to get out of there. If it was going to be a disaster, I wanted it over fast. I was one of two guys from the entire Midwest who joined VVAW at that point. So we were made Midwest coordinators. We were in charge, although there wasn't anybody. And for a couple of years, I took part in some demonstrations and I, I gave some speeches. Didn't really try to organize anything until the spring of 1970, shortly before Kent State, actually. Um, I'd read a very powerful book on Nazi Germany in the period in which it went Nazi. And I was very concerned about the direction that our country was going um, because it not only was in this terrible mistake and doing terrible things in it, it was also trying to keep anyone from saying that. There was more and more hostility toward freedom of speech. I remember when I was in Vietnam, there was a day that uh, there had been something in the news about anti-war demonstrators, and a couple of my men were discouraged by it. And they said, you know, what do you think of this anti-war stuff, Lieutenant? And I said, well, I think they're wrong. But we better hope that they keep speaking. And I said, you know, I mean, there are two considerations as far as I'm concerned. One is, we're all in the army here. Let's face it, there are people above us who get dumb ideas. Not necessarily all of the people and not necessarily all the ideas, but anything that acts as a question, do we want to do this, is in your interest and mine, guys. Secondly, what's the point of being the home of the brave if we're not the land of the free? I didn't think then that I would become one, a demonstrator. I didn't think, uh, I can remember seeing on uh, Armed Forces television, guys with hair to their shoulders. I said to my company commander, never ever will I have hair to my shoulders. Wrong. Um, I came back to a country as a war hero of sorts. Um, and nobody I respected, respected what I had done. And for the most part, the people who were excited about what I had done, I had no respect for. It was very, very painful. A um, handful of us went in 1970 to march in the 4th of July parade. We're all Vietnam vets, maybe six of us. We wanted to march with a flag and a sign saying Vietnam Veterans Against the War. The police ran us out. I wonder if you could imagine what it feels like to fight for your country and be thrown out of the Fourth of July parade for wanting to talk about the war. I spent a lot of years doing anti-war work and they were hard years. Uh, for the most part, I'm proud of what I did. Uh, I, I think there were, in some ways, as many mistakes made in the anti-war movement as there were in the war itself. Um, the, the turning of the hostility against the war 
into hostility against the soldiers. It was in some ways a very human error, but it was a terrible, terrible mistake that we're still paying for. I work with Vietnam veterans now, and if there's a common denominator, because whenever you have 10 Vietnam vets together, you have probably 15 opinions. We're, we disagree on an awful lot. Our experience was very different from one another, even in the same service, even in the same year. Um, but if there's a unifying factor, it's a sense of betrayal. We disagree seriously on who betrayed us. Some would name Richard Nixon, some would name Jane Fonda, uh, some will say it was the press that spoiled the good war. Um, a lot of different viewpoints. In some way or other, we all felt let down. And I can remember during the bicentennial on the 4th of July, I went with my mother to uh, watch the fireworks. I was in my middle 30s. I like fireworks. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that they would play the national anthem. And I was at a point in my life when I could not stand for the national anthem. I'm past that now. I've worked a lot of stuff through and I'm much more balanced on my country, thank God. And I'm God as far as that goes. <clears throat> but I want you to know that I don't think many people came to the anti-war movement lightly or easily. Um, I didn't. Thank you, Dr. Kramer. <clears throat> Thank you. When uh, President Wilson asked me to be a part of this panel this morning with my old colleague, Gene McCarthy, Bill Crandall, he said we were to talk about the dissenting side of the war. I took uh, some courage in coming here knowing that Hampton and Sydney, for whom this college is named, were famous dissenters uh, against the British. Some two centuries ago, <clears throat> but there's a little uh, uh, dis disconcerting uh, aspect about all of that in that uh, they were both executed. Uh, so far, Gene and I have uh, escaped that, although I must say uh, on election night, 1972, when I uh, learned about an hour after the polls had closed that I had lost every state but one, I thought that was the next thing to execution. Um, I don't think it's possible to uh, understand either the dissent against the war or uh, the reason that war turned out the way it did without some quick uh, consideration of the uh, history of that effort, uh, sometimes uh, those of us who were critical of U.S. involvement in Vietnam uh, were uh, indicted by supporters of the war who said this war was not lost in Vietnam. Uh, it was lost in the United States. It was decided here, uh, not on the battlefield. Now, one can argue that proposition. I think that uh, Bill Crandall just put his finger on some of the real problems, which were the uh, forces that were moving out there in, in Vietnam, the military, the political, psychological, cultural factors that probably were uh, decisive. But to whatever extent it's true that the war was decided here in the United States, I suggest to you that that's a tribute to the American public and to our democratic process. As I go around the country on the lecture circuit, as I do uh, a considerable amount of time, I hear Americans all over this country uh, complaining about their inability to be heard in Washington the feeling that somehow um, elections come and go, but that the frustrations and anguish and concerns of uh, people at the grassroots level somehow don't get through uh, 
to policy makers in Washington. So if it's true that in the 1960s and early 1970s, the American public was able to bring enough pressure on policy makers in Washington to force an end to a war that I think a majority of Americans had come to believe was a mistake, then that is not a criticism of our political process or of the uh, expression of dissent. It's a tribute to how democracy is supposed to work when the people really become aroused and express uh, their views. <clears throat> Professor Heinemann um, asked us to tell when we had changed our mind on the war. I'm somewhat like Jane. I, I can't remember a time when I was ever for American involvement in Vietnam. And I think where some of the confusion comes is on that much celebrated Gulf of Tonkin vote in August of 1964 where every member, of the <clears throat> every member of the House voted for the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And only two uh, senators, uh, Greening and Morris, uh, voted against it. And somehow that has created the impression that only two people were at that time uh, opposed to the war. Simply not true. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, as Jean McCarthy said so well was a manufactured uh, incident. Supposedly, uh, we were being asked to uh, endorse a limited uh, retaliation by the president against the North Vietnamese for attacking two American destroyers. We now know that no such attack ever occurred, but no one uh, knew that uh, at the time with the possible exception of the commanders of those destroyers who were unable to, uh, to be heard as effectively as they uh, should have been. But uh, I remember clearly walking over to the Senate on that resolution uh, with serious doubts about it. Uh, Gaylord Nelson, the Senate, senator from Wisconsin, had a resolution that he was going to introduce modifying the original one, which would have said, in effect, nothing in this resolution <clears throat> or support for it should be construed as indicating an endorsement of the American war effort uh, in Indochina. It was supposed to uphold the hand of the president uh, at a time when he was being challenged for re-election by Senator Goldwater and to uh, indicate that uh, the Congress was with him in retaliating against unprovoked attacks on American ships on the high seas. The resolution did say that the president would have authority to take such additional action as he thought appropriate. And that being in there, I think it was a mistake for all of us who voted for that resolution. But at no time could one make a historically sound case that that's what took us into Vietnam. That resolution had very little to do with the administration's plans in Vietnam. The war was already uh, in high gear. Let me just say for myself, and I think Jean uh, would share this view, I thought Lyndon Johnson would wind up that war as soon as the November elections were over. He was being challenged by Senator Goldwater for not doing more, and he said, we're not going north, we're not going south, we're not going to send American boys to fight in a war that should be decided by Asian boys. We're not going to bomb. We're not going to do this. I believed that. I thought that Lyndon Johnson was a shrewd American politician who knew that that war was not in the American national interest and would end it once that election was out of the way. <clears throat> but I hope no one here uh, will assume that there were only two people in the Congress of the United States who had doubts or opposition to that war, even as early as August of 1964. <clears throat> My own knowledge of this area uh, began with a lucky break for me. I went to uh, Northwestern University after World War II. I had served as a bomber pilot in the war, and I signed up under the GI Bill and went all the way through to a PhD in history at uh, 
Northwestern, including studies that took me into the Far East, studying what was going on in Asia. There was a book that came out about that time by Professor Owen Lattimore in which he predicted that Indochina would revolt, that India would break away from Britain, that Indonesia would break away uh, from the Dutch. He said all of Asia is out of control and these revolutionary movements will not be contained either by Western powers, by the Soviet Union, or by anyone else. <clears throat> and he traced the revolt against colonialism, the revolt against oppression, the revolt against social and economic injustice, and almost called the shots on all of these revolutions, including the one that we were drawn into in Southeast Asia. Even then, Ho Chi Minh, who had led the uh, independence movement first against the French and then against the Japanese after they were involved in Southeast Asia, was desperately trying for American support, writing a declaration of independence that almost word for word was a copy of ours. About the only thing he changed was uh, to change all men are created uh, equal to all people are uh, created uh, equal, but in any event, uh, he was clearly the authentic uh, revolutionary leader of Indochina. He was a communist, a practicing, admitted uh, communist, no question about that, an ideology that uh, probably none of us in this room have ever uh, endorsed, but he was also a popular nationalist leader uh, who started a revolution against uh, France that in many respects had the earmarks of our revolution against Britain in which uh, Hampton and Sydney died a couple of centuries uh, uh, earlier. And the great mistake I think that we made in intervening in Vietnam was to try to prop up puppet governments in the South that never had broad support from the Vietnamese people uh, across the countryside. And every time we bombed one of those villages or sent these search and destroy missions out, Bill, as you know, <clears throat> we were recruiting tens of thousands of people against the government we were supposedly uh, trying to defend. It was those considerations that led me uh, to become a strong uh, opponent of our involvement in Vietnam. I never felt that our military were fundamentally at fault, either in the design of this war uh, or its conduct. From the very beginning, there were top uh, military uh, men in the, in the Pentagon and elsewhere who opposed American involvement. When General Eisenhower was asked to intervene in 1954 to help the French, he sent General Ridgway out there. Our commander in the Korean War, General Ridgway came back and urged President Eisenhower not to send a single soldier uh, into Vietnam, and Eisenhower largely listened to that advice. General Ridgway then sat down to write his memoirs, and he said, when I go to meet my maker someday, the one achievement of which I will be most humbly proud is that I kept the United States out of Vietnam. How sad it is uh, to read those words uh, 30 years uh, and more later uh, and realize that the counsels of General uh, Ridgway, even the best instincts of General Eisenhower, General Gavin, and others uh, were, uh, were not heeded, and we plunged into that conflict. But it was knowledge of that kind uh, that led me to oppose this war. I finally went there myself. Uh, during the Thanksgiving period of 1965. I had a son-in-law fighting with the 3rd Marines at, at Chu Lai that I uh, visited. I stayed overnight with one of our most uh, distinguished generals, General Lou Walt of Kansas, who uh, was quartered at Da Nang. And I asked uh, him and his fellow officers, uh, what about the problem of shelling villages, shelling these... Uh, areas that we call harassment and interdiction areas. Don't we kill more innocent people than we do uh, combatants? Uh, 
And the general, I think, uh, as truthfully as he could, said we try to exercise great caution to see that that doesn't happen. There was a reporter there from Newsweek magazine who privately asked me to visit one of the civilian hospitals in Da Nang the next day, which I did. I walked into that huge hospital. There was a room about the size of this gymnasium. They'd taken down all the partitions. And every place you could put a little cot or a sleeping bag or a carpet or a straw mat was a terribly wounded Vietnamese civilian. Little children with their faces torn off, uh, old people with arms uh, missing. Uh, the worst slaughter you could possibly uh, see. Five uh, Danish doctors who were there as volunteers and a few nurses who had volunteered badly overworked trying to take care of this wreckage uh, of the war. I think that was the day I decided that uh, I not only had to be against this war, but had to be uh, against it 100% and go all out uh, to do everything I possibly could to stop it. Occasionally these days I have people ask me if I regret being uh, such a, a strident critic of the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. My only regret is that it didn't come sooner and louder and with more force and more uh, effectiveness. I think that uh, the war probably was decided in the end uh, in, the, uh, uh, in American society here at home. And that, after all, is where we should decide whether we go to war. It's also the place where we can best decide how long we want to stay. Thank you. <clears throat> Perhaps uh, in the protest movement, uh, mistakes were made. That uh, it's possible that the the protesters alienated uh, Americans who might have joined forces with you, uh, but who did not. I wonder if uh, you and the the senators can comment on uh, again the experience in in the movement, and if there are some things that you might have done differently to build a stronger coalition uh, against the war? Well, I, I think an awful lot of it was generational. Um, I remember when I was a teenager, my father would quote to me frequently, it seemed very frequently, uh, a comment of Mark Twain's that when I was 20, I thought my father was stupid, Twain said. Uh, by the time I got to be 40, I was amazed at how much the old guy had learned. And I thought this was a pretty dumb, self-serving quote when I was 20. And my father was pretty stupid to keep shoving it down my throat. Uh, there were a number of issues that, that in the late 60s and early 70s uh, provoked the generation gap. The war was one of them. The, the whole understanding of what jobs were about was one of them. Sex was one of them. Drugs certainly were one. There were a number of things that led, I think, uh, a very large segment of my generation to think that suddenly we had discovered the entirety of truth. Uh, our, it had always been there. Our parents were just too dumb to notice. Uh, and, and we were very elegant about it a, a lot of times. I think there was an aspect that infiltrated the anti-war movement that was really parental conflict. And, and we, we took that out in a way that was very alienating. We had a way of basically saying, um, not uh, my fellow countrymen, there's something terrible going on that you don't understand properly, but we had a tendency more often to say, you stupid monsters, we're going to stop this or break your backs. So it's not good politics. Senator McCarthy, in uh, your campaign for the presidency in 68, uh, uh, Looking back on it, uh, were there other options open to you, things that you might have done differently? Uh, might you have somehow you and uh, Robert Kennedy or the heirs of Robert Kennedy have joined forces more uh, forcefully uh, to uh, win that, the nomination that year? 
Well, it's awfully hard to say. There's so many things happened in that campaign that we had no way of anticipating, uh, especially the assassination of Robert Kennedy and the Johnson withdrawal and the Martin Luther King assassination. So it, was, it developed into kind of a chaotic situation. Uh, actually, to, to go back to 68, it was all easier for people like me and Senator McGovern to oppose it because we had a kind of institutional responsibility which the Senate had failed to uh, carry out. And also, I think we both shared a sense of responsibility for the Democratic Party and what it had done. That party had faced with two real moral challenges and political challenges in, this, in the last half century. The first was on civil rights, 48, and the party split over that issue, but they split the party being on the right side of it, and the Democrats were primarily responsible for perpetuating segregation and discrimination, but they said no. In the same way, they were primarily responsible for the escalation of the war. And in 68, uh, we asked them to sort of straighten it out. In fact, the party had never endorsed the war. Uh, it had been an administration war, and the Chicago Convention, really the principal point of the convention. I don't think it would have made much difference what we did at that point. The issue at the campaign was whether or not the Democratic Party would take responsibility for the war, something they had not done before that. And the drive of the Johnson administration and represented by Humphrey was to get the party to endorse what they had done. And I think the reaction you had as it manifests through the Chicago police was I don't know what you call it, normal or natural, I say historical, uh, was to do what they did, which was to, to strike out at those who were making them take responsibility. It's true in individual eyes, it's certainly true on a national scale, and that it was almost certain to be violent, I think, before the convention, before my campaign even began, especially young people and older people who were frustrated, saying there's no way you can work in the system. And at the convention, it all came kind of to a head. And in that case, uh, it was really the, well, if you, if you look at the pictures of the convention, you've generally found five or six policemen beating on one rioter, supposedly. Most riot scenes, you'll have one policeman beating on five or 10 rioters. But the ratios were like the reverse in Chicago. It was, it was the police five to one, roughly, backed up by the National Guard, which had no business being there, and as we learned later, uh, reserve units of the regular army were also being held in reserve in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, it was, uh, as you may remember, at the same time of the uprising in Czechoslovakia, and uh, Someone sent me a, an album that he'd put together at that time. He had, on one side he had pictures of Chicago, on the other side he had pictures of Prague. And if it wasn't for the uniform, you wouldn't have known which was which. You could recognize the Prague military, and you could recognize the Chicago police. So it was really a period of, of uh, out of control, really. Uh, who was responsible? Um, I don't know, it just it, it developed to a chaotic situation and the convention sort of epitomized the whole thing and uh, what could have been done about it. Actually, if we had not done so well in the primaries, I think we might have been able to handle it. Um, and we anticipated maybe getting 25 or 30 percent as a kind of showing that 25 or 30 percent of the Democratic Party was opposed to the war and that Johnson then might make some adjustment. But the complication was that we beat him. And once that had happened, we were in a position to say, well, you know, you can have half a war, uh, and we'll have half a war, or half a piece, if you can divide that way. And they couldn't say, well, you beat us, so we're going to have to make concessions to you now. So it, it was just kind of a hard rock confrontation on, on, on that basis. It went right on through the convention. Uh, and as I said, the party never really recovered from it. Uh, I don't know really what the lessons were. Uh, because it's, they were sort of personalized in terms of the Johnson administration and that whole approach, which may never be repeated again. 
President Johnson uh, and George has indicated that talking golf was not going to do anything and uh, the whole progression was Johnson, most of his experience was in driving cattle. And if you drive cattle, you start them slowly, you sing to them, say nothing's going to happen. And then you kind of pick up the pace, you know, so when you get them where you want them, they're stampeded and don't have time to think about it. And that whole image and metaphor really applied through the whole campaign where we got deeply involved. Uh, even the language that he used was out of the cattle experience. He accused those of us who challenged him of, of cutting and running, which is the only way to get out of a stampede. But the progression of it was that we're not going anyplace. Tonga Gulf doesn't mean anything. The uh, campaign that George described, uh, uh, we're not going to send boys to Asia. The next thing you know, it was 160,000 and 200,000. And each time we increased the military commitment, uh, the defenders of the war gave a, a more comprehensive purpose. First, it was civil war in the South. Uh, then it was an invasion from the North. Then Russ said the Chinese were coming. He talked about the yellow, well, he didn't call it the yellow horde. He said it'd be a billion Chinese. And where they were coming, we didn't know. And finally, when they got 500,000 there, it had to be the security and freedom, of, uh, security of the, of the free world. But it didn't start out saying we're going to you know, protect the security of the free world. It was, it was a minimal sort of engagement in dealing with a, a civil war in South Vietnam and the escalation of justification came after the commitment of troops. So it was wholly irrational, at least in its base, although it was a certain logical progression of, of what was originated in a kind of irrational proposition. Senator McGovern, uh, reviewing the situation, uh, would you have done some things different tactically, uh, looking particularly perhaps at your own election campaign in 1972? Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, two things I'd like to say about that. Number one, uh, symbols are very important in American politics. It's easy to underestimate uh, the importance of uh, symbolism. Uh, and I think that in a way, those symbols were uh, orchestrated against those who descended from the war to create the impression that somehow you weren't quite patriotic if you opposed American uh, uh, involvement in Vietnam. And one of the things that fed that, I think, were the uh, extreme actions of some of the people that perhaps thought they were helping the anti-war effort, uh, but who uh, obviously were not. I remember a parade in Atlanta, Georgia, one day. It was called a parade for peace and justice. And I was asked to uh, join as one of the leaders of that parade. The mayor of Atlanta was involved, uh, the president of the United Auto Workers, uh, Mrs. Martin Luther King. I remember the four or five of us had a kind of, we, we joined arms, and we were leading this, this large parade. Everything was going along very fine. There was no disturbance of any kind until we got in front of the reviewing stand where all the television cameras and press were waiting. At that point, a young couple jumped out from the curb, and they had taken an American flag and cut it up into a uh, bi bikini for the, for the girl. And the boy had on, uh, I guess what you call a, a jockey strap made out of the uh, flag, and they jumped in front of the parade carrying a a sign, uh, McGovern for President, stop the war. Uh, this was not helpful. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what was more disturbing were the unctuous columns that were written by uh, several reporters saying if George McGovern thinks he's going to get to the White House tearing up the American flag and disporting it that way, he's got another thing uh, coming. Now, obviously, you can't control uh, factors of that uh, kind, um, but I do remember after the election standing in the Senate cloakroom one day with a group of senators, and uh, Senator Talmadge of Georgia said to me, you know, George, I haven't said anything about your campaign, but somehow I think you gave the impression to the American people that you were angry 
at the country rather than angry about the policy makers that took us into that war. If in fact that was the signal that I was sending, that somehow I was down on America, uh, obviously that was a political uh, mistake. I didn't intend to send such a signal. I've always thought that my role against the war was as patriotic as anything I ever did. As a matter of fact, I can't recall any single bombing mission in World War II where I was shaking as much as I was the first time I took the floor as a freshman senator to speak against our policy in Vietnam at a time when John Kennedy was still in the, uh, in the White House, my friend for whom I'd worked uh, formally. So I never felt unpatriotic. I, I've always uh, treasured the fact I was born in this country and had an opportunity to serve it. But if somehow we were sending out signals, intentionally or otherwise, that we were against America, rather than against a dreadfully mistaken policy in Vietnam, then that was a political mistake that I regret. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open the floor uh, for, for questions now. Uh, if you will move to uh, one of the microphones, I will recognize you. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is a conspiracy afoot here. Uh, the protest voice has been reduced to two microphones rather than four. <laughs> You know we've been having some difficulty with audio. Uh, we now have two microphones, one in the center aisle and one in the uh, far aisle on my right. I know this uh, may discriminate against uh, those of you over here on the left, but please feel free to move to uh, one of the other microphones. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, my name is... My name is Sally Waters, and I work here at Hamden, Sydney. I have a question for Senator McGovern. <coughs> Uh, while it may be dangerous to uh, oversimplify history or to identify national destiny, I'd like to ask you if you feel that it is valid to compare the United States experience in Vietnam with the Soviet Union's experience in Afghanistan and considering what you had said earlier about our past history and and the coming uh, breakdown of, of a number of colonial empires, do you think that these wars were almost inevitable, whether they occurred, where they did? And do you think that some of the uh, earlier speakers' comments that we were successful because look what's happened now to, to the communist empire, do you think this is uh, a, a valid conclusion? Uh. I think there is a parallel, uh, obvious differences too, but I think there is a parallel between the Soviet experience in Afghanistan, where, which is a very sad experience from their standpoint, and our involvement in Vietnam in that in both cases the intervening power was bumping up against very powerful nationalistic forces that rebelled against any foreign army or any foreign uh, intervention. If you look at the uh, Vietnamese, uh, they fought for a hundred years to get the French out of there, then the Japanese, then us. The war was no sooner over uh, with us, a war in which we were told that the Vietnamese were just puppets of the Chinese, than the Chinese and the Vietnamese mixed it up. A lot of people have forgotten that brief war that uh, followed our intervention there. But I think the Russians ran into some of those same factors in Afghanistan, people that didn't want Russians in there, no matter what their motives uh, were. And so the uh, uh, forces that resisted that Soviet uh, invasion got widespread support uh, on the part of rank-and-file people against the, uh, across the country, and the results were quite similar to what we encountered in Vietnam. I'm not going to go into all the differences between the two cases, but you ask about the similarities. I think there are uh, similarities. As to whether <coughs> uh, Vietnam was simply a part of our uh, battle against uh, uh, communism, uh, 
It's always seemed to me that the uh, reason the Soviet system and the communist system uh, has collapsed uh, in, on as widespread a basis as it has is because it's a bad system. Uh, it's, uh, it's not the kind of system that most human beings enjoy uh, living under. Now, it may be possible that we helped accelerate the collapse of uh, communism by uh, forcing them to divert so many of their resources to military purposes they couldn't take care of the needs of the people at home. Uh, that was part of the strategy in the minds of some of our people, not all of them, that one of the uh, tools of the Cold War was the spending war, just to drive them into, uh, into bankruptcy. The trouble with that is that we almost succeeded in taking ourselves along uh, with this bankruptcy route. There are very few countries other than ours that owe $4 trillion, and a big part of that is the Cold War deficit, as you, uh, as you know. But I've always thought the best way to combat uh, communism uh, uh, is uh, in places like Asia is by dealing with the problems that breed communism, the hunger, the disease, the bad governments, the uh, absence of hope. I think those are the things that gave communism its head uh, for a long period uh, of time. And the more we can come down on the side of a constructive approach to the world's problems, the more our system will flourish and the less communism will appear to be attractive. My name, my name is uh, James Smiley, and I <coughs> teach at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. I am prompted to ask this question uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, Senator McCarthy made some reference to uh, a Reston, a uh, Presbyterian, who uh, gets the New York Times off the hook uh, in the presence of Almighty God by his writings. And secondly, I'm interested in the participation of the religious communities uh, in the debate over the war and would like to know uh, if uh, any of the participants here would uh, comment. Uh, I did some work on the statements that were uh, put out by the different voluntary organizations, uh, the uh, ecumenical organizations like the National Council of Churches and the Catholic bishops organizations, uh, as well as the denominations. And uh, the religious community was quite torn, uh, moving, first of all, to support the war and learning then more about it. And as I've discovered, they began to discuss it on just war basis. And uh, they moved from uh, an understanding, uh, at least those who got some uh, statements out of denominations, statements, by the way, which were very deferential to the public authorities in most cases. Some denominations could only ask questions. But they moved from a feeling that the war was being conducted in an unjust way, as the casualties began to mount, to then questioning the justice of the war, which they had uh, uh, agreed to as we began to get involved in the war. And I, I would just like to hear from you persons uh, what, whether these statements the church has made however deferential, made any influence on you, whether you were uh, supported by the religious community or not, or just what you feel about the religious communities, synagogues, and churches' involvement in this debate. I think they played a major role. Uh, the moral aspect of the war was a critical factor in this country deciding that it didn't want to do that any longer. Um, and the churches played a significant role in that. One, I think one of the difficulties in the anti-war movement was that it was such a mixed group that you, rightly so, had people with very different agendas, including uh, revolution, uh, support of, of the communists, whatever. The moral tone was very important to capture uh, at, a, at a sort of grassroots level. Um, I know in the, the work that we did in Vietnam Veterans Against the War, 
we found, we found significant support, even at a point where uh, we camped for a week on the mall in Washington, uh, ended up throwing away our medals. I think it was one of the turning points in the war. Uh, when we were being threatened with forcible arrest if we didn't leave the mall, uh, a number of churches offered us space to go to. Ultimately, we decided we'd rather be arrested, and ultimately the police decided they would not arrest us. They were helpful. Well, I think the most, uh, I, I don't know what most significant, but uh, important uh, kind of rally against the war was early in January when the clergy and others united against the war had their meeting in Washington, D.C. I get back in good grace with the Presbyterians. It was sponsored by the Presbyterian Church at 14th Street under the auspices of, a, of the Presbyterian minister at the time. And those involved were uh, priests and Catholics and Orthodox and various Protestant denominations and rabbis, and they were they were people who had to be accepted as respectable. They were not fringe people, and the administration was really shaken. They couldn't say this is a bunch of kooks, and you know, uh, it was it was a genuine serious protest. And I don't think they ever recovered from it. The administration didn't know how to attack that particular group, but it gave encouragement to those of us who were in politics. And, uh, well, there were three of us from the Senate who spoke there. Wayne Moore spoke, and Ernest Greening, and I did. And it may have kind of formed what, what my campaign, because uh, Wayne, had, he'd take, he took up all the legal arguments, so I couldn't say it was illegal after he'd said it was. And Ernest Greening was very moral. He sort of spoke like the Old Testament. He said the war was highly immoral, so I couldn't say that. So I finally said it, it just doesn't make sense under the doctrine of the relationship of means to ends, which you talked about, that you couldn't justify it on purely pragmatic grounds, that the, either the methods you were using were inordinate to the purpose or the purposes you set, even though they were good, were destroyed because the methods were immoral. And it, it ranged in that area from saying immoral means to saying actually the war itself was immoral. But in the beginning, it was sort of the other way around. But the, the contribution of the clergy in that particular instance and through the war was uh, much more significant, for example, than it was in the early stages of the civil rights fight. If I could just add one word on that. I think uh, one of the problems early on in the anti-war movement is that it appeared to the public to be uh, dominated by young people, primarily by university young people. The uh, entrance of the churches, the clergy and the laity and uh, churches across the country added a new dimension in that, among other things, it brought many older people into the movement and in a more uh, visible uh, role. And it also did add a, a moral component to it that I think uh, is probably essential in any kind of successful uh, political protest. So that uh, I think the uh, the churches did play a, an important and, and helpful role. As I said earlier, interestingly enough, I think the first clear opposition to the war probably came from members of the military, uh, then probably the United States Senate with uh, uh, several senators speaking out. Uh, then the universities, and then the churches, roughly in that order. I'm James O'Brien, uh, Tidewater Community College professor, and a retired second lieutenant. Uh, in the Richmond campaign, um, a little me, bit sir. lower. Is that mic on? Hello? Test, yeah, test. Right. Did you get your mouth on it? Yeah. Uh, in your Richmond campaign, Senator McCarthy, we were very careful about wearing coats and ties and how we presented ourselves to Richmonders, having lived there all those years and been born there. When I went to uh, Washington, D.C. as a graduate student at Catholic University, we also took that kind of approach, uh, being sensitive to who we were speaking to in Congress and so forth. It was clear to us, though, that we were being photographed, that our phones were being tapped in the student government offices and the publications, and that at some of the protests there were more uh, CIA, FBI, uh, military intelligence types than there were protesters. Nobody jumped out in front of anybody with a bikini on. And it's, I wonder to what degree uh, the three of you have had experience with the dirty tricks that were 
subsequently called uh, during the Nixon campaign being applied to your campaigns as a um, organized effort? Well, uh, there wasn't so much of it uh, of that kind in my campaign so, so far as I know. Uh, although uh, some of the young people, my children said, you could always tell the FBI and the CIA and the police who were pretending to be hippie because they would change all their clothes but not their shoes. So if you ever get caught up in that, look at their shoes because uh, the policemen, FBI guys want to have comfortable feet when they're out on the street. And they either had tennis shoes that were too new or they were wearing their GI issue and you could pick them out. And they were there and uh, that's the only serious observation. We were really molested more by the uh, Secret Service were very reliable people, I thought, in my campaign. We moved into the hotel in Chicago. They said, um, this room is not bugged. We'll, you can say anything in the room you want to, but they said, don't use the telephone. <laughs> so we can't protect you on the telephone. And they were right. We found out later that Army intelligence had us tapped in the Irving hearings, uh, and uh, they said they were, we were in communication with the subversive group over in the park. We actually had a, we were pretty smart. We had a command post over there to see if anything bad was developing so we could stop it. And I've forgotten what these students called themselves, like, you know, radicals for radicalism or something. And the army was watching us because we were talking to our own people. Uh, and uh, they used that as their justification. So there, there was official surveillance, but uh, I, I, I don't know uh, really of any any kind of secret sort of uh, disturbance that was caused. Uh, uh, the FBI, uh, it's kind of vulgar, but uh, they said that um, uh, the Chicago Police the FBI, that students were throwing excrement out of the Hilton Hotel. Well, it's almost impossible to do it. The Hilton Hotel had these windows that opened like louvers. You'd have to be able to throw a kind of a Martin ball. It would. <laughs> <laughs> would kind of go down and then come up and then go out over the over the roof and hit the policeman down there and uh, in our defense we said well if they bring it in we'd like to have it tested <laughs> because we thought it might prove to have been J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> but it was a ridiculous sort of charge I think Senator McGovern had more I always thought George that, that demonstration at the Doral Hotel against you was, yeah. was, was planned. You yeah. could talk about that. But that, we, we were hard pressed, but we, yeah. we had defenses in mind. <laughs> I think uh, it is true that the dirty tricks really came into their own in the 72 uh, campaign rather than 68. But I never blamed it on uh, government agencies. I, I think we now know from the Watergate investigation where most of the dirty tricks were coming from. Senator McCarthy's quite right about one celebrated uh, eruption in the Doral Hotel where I had my headquarters during the 72 convention. I had not uh, come down to the convention the first couple of days. I pretty much stayed up in my room, which was the tradition, until you were actually nominated. But um, right after the uh, convention got underway, there was a really raucous demonstration that just took over the Doral Hotel. The most disreputable people you can imagine swarmed into the lobby, supposedly uh, McGovern supporters. And uh, I'm not going to go into all the things they did, but they were designed to be as revolting uh, as possible. And uh, I finally went down to confront them thinking they were McGovern supporters, since that's what they said they were. And it was a very unsatisfactory uh, situation, screaming and shouting and defecating, everything you can think of in the lobby of this beautiful hotel, all on network uh, television, these crazy Democrats again. Well, we now know from the Watergate investigation, those people weren't are part of our campaign at all. They were paid people uh, in the Nixon Dirty Tricks campaign, of which we had a great many in 72. They were sent there as paid people to disrupt the, uh, the convention. There's no point going through this sad story any further, but time after time we encountered uh, incidents of that kind that uh, we had no way of knowing at the time were contrived 
in the um, opposition camp. Very frankly, I had not been familiar with that kind of politics before. I know there are those who say, well, politicians always do that kind of thing to each other. I had not seen uh, tactics of that kind in any previous uh, uh, presidential campaign. And I think the Watergate era was the worst in terms of dirty tricks and unethical uh, politics. I don't blame it on the government. Um, uh, as, as Gene said, the Secret Service was uh, terrific. Um, I have no hesitance in saying I probably wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for the uh, Secret Service. I have great confidence in them. You'll remember as it came out in the Watergate investigation is that Nixon set up his illegal plumbers unit to deal initially with Daniel Ellsberg and Vietnam veterans against the war. Um, we had a fair amount of infiltration, um, which is difficult in an organization where everybody had a military background. We, we had um, active duty Army intelligence guys who were serious members of VVAW, um, and they were reporting back to military intelligence. Some of those reports uh, basically said, you ought to listen to these guys. Uh, some of them were very bogus. Um, I think the, the best experience that we had out of it was in our national office in New York. We reached a point where we couldn't pay our phone bill anymore, and we called the phone company and said, you're going to have to take our phone out. We can't cover this. They said, it's, it's being paid for. Because, because <laughs> they wanted to listen to our conversation. At that point, we started passing out our credit card number throughout the entire movement. Charge your calls to VVAW. So the FBI basically handled the phone bill, or whatever agency, handled the phone bill for the anti-war movement, and I think it was a patriotic service. Well, that's right. You know, he, when he put out the list of, uh, what do they call them, the not most wanted, but the enemies list, there were a lot of services that you could get if you were on the list. Uh, sort of telephone bills. They'd pay your telephone bills if you wanted to keep up with And actually, you could, you could have had secretarial service because they were recording every, you could, they'd get rid of the secretary, would just call up uh, the Nixon dirty tricks crowd and pick up our messages. Uh, it, it, it was almost a, an economic advantage to, to, to be on the list. It was a bad time. I, I always thought the worst corruption was, well, that was really the Washington Post, but they, they tried to corrupt a librarian. I mean, you've got to draw the line someplace. I said, I said, uh, and that was really over the edge. So they're, they're a bad bunch. What they did to George, you say, well, he can defend himself, but librarians are sacred. And I should, you know, after that, no defense could work. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jan Fulch from Longwood College. Uh, my question is actually directed at Dr. Crandall. Um, you had touched upon the question I was going to ask, but I wondered if you could e expound on the relationship between the anti-war movement and the reaction against the Vietnam vets when they came back. It's hard to, it, it's hard to say. At, at, at this point, one of, I think, the, the great folklore pieces um, regarding Vietnam vets is that every one of us was spat upon by an anti-war person. Um, in literal terms, it happened, but I think not an awful lot. In, uh, in, in broader terms, it happened, but it wasn't just the anti-war movement. Um, I can remember hearing from, well, older, older men saying that we hadn't really fought. If we had really fought, we could have won, but we hadn't really fought. Um, I can remember hearing from people who said that we were crazy to go. Um, they weren't anti-war. Um, Nixon made a, a great deal of noise about what he called the silent majority, which was presumably the large mass of the American people keeping their mouths shut about the war. Um, we, got a, we got a very cold shoulder coming home, and, and we got it all around. I, I think that we were not understood. Uh, we made a very good focal point, and especially after the My Lai story broke, um, for the war crimes that were committed. And there were serious crimes that were committed, and they were done by guys in the field. One of the things that we did in, in DVAW was to organize something called the Winter Soldier Investigation, in which 
125 Vietnam veterans testified from, from every unit that served in Vietnam, testified to war crimes that had been committed from rape and torture to ambushes to free fire zones, whole broad range of horrors. And what, what the testimony did was to link it to policy, was to say that this is not a few guys who are out of, out of control. This is a, a, a war that is out of control. Well, Bill, I, I think we should make a point of this, that, that opposition to the war was significantly helped by, by veterans, even before you were formally organized. And you know, when you do something like, well, if George and I had been executed, we'd be national heroes. Like, you know, it's hard you to get executed right. in this country. Yeah, you, you, you can be a, sort of exiled uh, and ignored, but execution is hard to come by. But uh, the, when you're doing these things, you sort of look for something beyond. You could say it's irrational, it doesn't make any sense, they're, they're stupid, and then you want some other sort of support. And uh, I think the earliest came to me was, was from a veteran. It was early in New Hampshire, early 68, and I had spoken, and I was given what I thought was a book. Uh, I put it in my pocket. And uh, when I got back to the hotel, I opened it up, and it was a case which I brought here with the Bronze Star Medal of Honor. And uh, I opened it up, and the message is here. And I'd, I'd like to ask Ronald to read it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's semi-literate, but... Uh, I received a medal for valor in Vietnam, but valor is a corollary of morality and this war is not moral. It has corrupted the men who fight it. It has divided the nation which conceived it. I cannot begin to recount the number of distasteful tasks I witnessed American soldiers perform, including the beating of women and children and the corruption of an entire population. Therefore, I cannot in clear conscience retain this reward for actions which are in essence or in essence, serve to suppress the freedom of the Vietnamese people. No signature. I think on, on this uh, question of the anti-war movement, I guess I'm gone. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I can shout uh, uh, my microphone. George, I want to say mine works. So that, you know, in 68, I said if elected, I would not necessarily put anybody on the moon, but we'd have public address systems that work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we, here we go. I, I just wanted to say that um, at no time during all those years of descending from the war, and I think this was true with uh, Senator McCarthy, did I ever once criticize the American men who were in Vietnam, it was my uh, compassion for them as much as anything else that led me to uh, oppose the, uh, the war. Those men were not the designers of the Vietnam War. They were the ones who were drafted or volunteered to uh, fight in a war that policymakers over whom they had no control uh, had designed. Uh, in some respects, uh, uh, the intellectuals of this country had as much to do with the design of that war uh, as anyone else. I remember the late Walter Lippmann once saying, uh, there's nothing more dangerous than a belligerent professor. Uh, and we had a lot of them uh, telling us how grand the strategy was in uh, uh, Vietnam. but. Um, my heart's always gone out to these Vietnam veterans. They were, in a sense, the ones we no both we most need to be concerned about. Uh, I came back from World War II and was treated like a hero. Wasn't anything hard about that, to come back home to that kind of a welcome. These boys uh, come back to a country that by then had largely turned against the war and decided it was a bad idea, not just because of the anti-war movement, but millions of people that never went to an anti-war rally decided the war was a mistake. And that was the attitude that greeted these young men when they came home. That's why we need to lean over backwards to be understanding and helpful to these veterans of the Vietnam War more than any other war in which this country's been involved. They need, they need help. <laughs>
My name is Chad Roberts, and I'm a student at Easy Glass High School. And I question to the three of you: Do you find any similarities between Vietnam and Bosnia Herzegovina? I, one of the things that heartened me is the extent to which Vietnam veterans in public life have been united on opposing intervention in Bosnia. It is. It's a very different case from Vietnam. Where the similarities are, I think, is that it's a, it's a very complex situation involving hatreds that are centuries old that we don't understand, that are much more complex than anything we understand. Um, my sense is that, as I read it, the Bosnians really feel that they're fighting against Turkish oppression, and there hasn't been Turkish oppression for much more than a century. There's, a, there's just this old, old stuff here that, particularly in this relatively young country, we have a hard time taking seriously, and we need to take it seriously if we're going to get involved in that kind of stuff. Before we get involved in it is the time to take it seriously. Mm, well, I, I could just support that. Our problem is that we don't have any, any myths from the past. We try to make them up for the future. And it gets you into strange contradictions. You know, Ronald Reagan would say, we're going to recapture our destiny. It's hard to do. <laughs> and so you get sort of mixed up along, uh, along the way while those concepts are running. And uh, as Bill had indicated, uh, in the case of Vietnam, we had no hatred of the Vietnamese before the war. They had no grounds for hating us. Harder to understand that kind of war in, in contrast with, with Bosnia, where almost beyond history, the conflicts have, have... And I don't really fault the administration for being confused. I think they should have realized, this we go back to Bush, that something like this would happen. And you may have been able to anticipate it, because either because of the record of history. Uh, we have a large, we call it Yugoslavs in northern Minnesota, and the conflicts there are almost the same as what you see in Bosnia, except they don't shoot each other. We had a vacancy in the Senate, the death of Hubert Humphrey, and uh, we had a Yugoslav congressman and a Yugoslav governor, and I said to the congressman, would you like to have me talk to the governor? I think he ought to appoint you to fill out that term. And he said, oh no, he said, you'll never appoint me. He said, I'm a Slovenian, he's a Croatian. So there it was in the same party, in the same part of the state, and something as simple as filling out a term, and uh, the old animosities were so strong that the Congress said, don't even ask him. He said, I don't want to give a Croatian a chance to refuse me. And so we should have anticipated the kind of trouble, uh, even though you couldn't do much about it. I think the, there are differences uh, in the Bosnian situation. If we could go back a couple of years when the uh, Serbs first jumped on the uh, Bosnians, uh, there probably should have been some kind of international intervention at that time uh, under, under United Nations auspices or under NATO, some kind of multilateral effort uh, to force an end. Uh, to the slaughter that later developed. It was quite different from Vietnam. Uh, in, uh, in Vietnam, uh, the only people fighting there were Vietnamese. Uh, there were no Chinese in Vietnam, no Russians. Uh, you had first the French, and then the Japanese, and then us. But the, uh, the, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any kind of a struggle similar to what was going on where you had uh, Serbs sweeping across the uh, border, uh, killing people in uh, what could only be a, a called an invasion. And I think it probably should have been challenged. It may be too late in the day uh, to do much about that situation. Now it's become steadily more complicated and more confused. There was a time when uh, President Clinton talked about airstrikes against the Serbs, but by the time he got Warren Christopher over to Europe, uh, the, the Croatians were hitting the Bosnians uh, uh, along with the Serbs. So the question then is, are you going to bomb Croatia as well as uh, Serbia? Then the Bosnians violated some of the ground rules that the uh, UN had laid down. The whole thing became so complicated and difficult uh, 
that um, I sympathize with the administration in not knowing quite what to do about that situation. It's clearly not primarily a U.S. responsibility. It's an international uh, responsibility, and I think the uh, Europeans and the U.N. Uh, leadership ducked it. The one other thing I'd just like to say on, on plans or, or discussions for intervening in Bosnia, it seems to me that as I read military history, uh, the history of warfare is a history of people expecting a very short war that always lasts longer than they expect. Uh, the Civil War was going to be over in weeks. The World War I was going to be over in a month. Uh, Vietnam was going to be over in 65. Uh, we were going to be out of Somalia by now. Um, sooner or later, we need collectively to learn that it doesn't work that way. People are tougher, whether right or wrong, than we give them credit for. Um, I, over the years, I've heard a lot of times that the anti-war movement encouraged the Vietnamese to keep fighting. Uh, it was their country, and they intended to have it be their country. Uh, in, in the Civil War, there was, there was in the North a faction of the Democratic Party that was known as the Peace Democrats. They thought the war ought to be ended short of winning it. And they were attacked for encouraging the Confederacy. Um, this deep into Virginia, I would ask you to think about uh, you think, you think Virginia needed much encouragement from Peace Nicks in Ohio to fight on the Civil War? I don't think so. I don't think so. People fight for themselves. We are running out of time. I'll take two more questions. Uh, Mr. Irwin? Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Owen. I'm a senior at Hampton Sydney College. Um, I have a question for the two senators. Over the past few days, we've heard about containment, the domino theory, and the importance of Southeast Asia, both strategically and because of the resources there. You two gentlemen opposed the military effort there. For the students in the audience, such as myself, that weren't out alive when you campaigned for presidency, what policies did y'all suggest for that area of the, area of the world? Well, uh, with regard to uh, uh, Indochina, I thought we should have come to terms with the uh, government in, in Hanoi. I still think that. They were the uh, legitimate government. At the time the French were defeated there in 1954 and President Eisenhower was urged to uh, intervene, he refused to do that. He said in his judgment that in a bona fide election, Ho Chi Minh would get 80% of the vote in both the North and the South. So what was this struggle all about? If we believed in self-determination, the right of people to control their own destiny, uh, we should have let that struggle run its course and uh, recognized the government, uh, which we'll eventually do. One of these days, uh, we'll get around to recognizing the government of, of uh, Hanoi. Uh, but. Uh, my, my answer to your question is that we didn't have any mission to stop those uh, revolutions in Indochina or in Indonesia or India. Thank God we got out of the Philippines without a, um, a revolution, as we said we would, and it was a wise thing uh, to do. I think we should have recognized in that period that we live in a world of ferment where millions of people are unhappy with the conditions of life and uh, we have one or two things. We can deal with those conditions to try to make them uh, uh, more acceptable, uh, or uh, we can go to war and try to stop the uh, revolutions they, uh, they produce. That's, what, that's the course we chose in, uh, in Vietnam, and I'm more certain with each passing year that it was a, a disastrous reading of the historical forces that were moving in that part of the world. <clears throat> Pretty well demonstrated what de Tocqueville said about wars from democratic countries, that they get into them too soon and they don't get out fast enough. And certainly that was the case in Vietnam. It was a sudden decision to go in, in a sense, uh, by Johnson, and then there was no way of getting out. You had to elect Richard Nixon as the price of doing that. 
I would follow that up because in the uh, previous sessions, in fact, uh, both Mr. Rostow and General Westmoreland claimed as a justification for the war uh, that we indeed won the war was that we preserved the strategic balance in Southeast Asia. We preserved transit through the Malacca Straits. There is stability there today. Therefore, Vietnam was the right effort to make. I wonder if you would comment on that explanation for victory in Vietnam. Well, that assumes that the uh, Vietnamese wanted to be our enemies. They didn't. From the very beginning, what the Vietnamese wanted was American cooperation and support. As I pointed out here earlier, they, uh, they adopted a Declaration of Independence that clearly was a bid for American approval. Now, that doesn't mean that we had to endorse communism any more than we endorsed it in the Soviet Union when we recognized uh, Moscow way back in 1933. But we should have come to terms with that government uh, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, they, were they wanted to trade with us. They wanted American investment. Uh, Ho Chi Minh never had any quarrel with the United States. The Vietnamese people never had any quarrel uh, with the United States. All we had to do was stay home and deal with them as we did with other communist countries, the Soviet Union, China, Yugoslavia, uh, Poland, other countries that had uh, communist governments. Those governments have all evolved without the necessity of American armies going in to show them how to uh, uh, organize life. I think that uh, in terms of any strategic problem in uh, Southeast Asia, what we were worried about or what our policymakers were worried about is that China was pulling the strings, that Ho Chi Minh was simply a puppet of China, and therefore we had to stand in uh, Vietnam, even if it took 500,000 American soldiers, to head off the possibility of Chinese penetration in that area. Actually, the Vietnamese and the Chinese have despised each other for a thousand years. We couldn't have had any more dependable barrier against Chinese penetration of Southeast Asia than the Vietnamese uh, under the man that eventually prevailed, uh, Ho Chi Minh. So I think in all due respect to General uh, Westmoreland, whom I have a high regard for, that uh, this, is a, this is a misreading of the strategic uh, advantage of our uh, involvement in Southeast Asia. Well, the, the domino theory never had any validity in any case. And as it turned the other way, you say, well, it actually went in reverse. The Chinese have become less communistic than they were, and the Russians have disintegrated. If the domino theory had been valid, why the success of the Vietnamese, if you call it that, would have gone all the way through southeastern Asia. I don't know. I think, Ronald, that, you know, the only thing worse than a little knowledge is being dangerous is to be a little bit of a historian. <laughs> <laughs> you make some terrible judgments because of a little knowledge of history, and they begin to reverse it and rewrite it. But uh, there are half a dozen things. The domino theory, for example, say the domino theory. You sound, you know, very, very wise when you say it. Or you get into things like Asia, the Asian program. I never heard of that till I got here. I understand it was developed in, in the Johnson Library a few years ago. They hadn't known what they had done, but when they did, they know, they know what it was all about because this is what happened and they, they're pleased with their work. Um, or, or the recent thing about the Space Defense Initiative. Uh, before the notice came out about the failures, they said this is what caused the Russians to crumble. But we now know the Russians knew it hadn't worked. So why would they crumble if they, if they knew it hadn't worked? They say, we're all right. That, thing doesn't work, so let's just go on and build some more offensive weapons, you say. So you discover these things as they, as they sort of come round, or, or, or this thing about protecting the narrow channels in Malaysia, you know, because that's the root of the Chinese, you won't be able to get any tea, you couldn't in the 14th century, if, if you control the channels, you know, so they're doing it again. Uh, back at the time when we were supporting Pakistan before the Russians got in, we had uh, Brzezinski, whom you have to watch, Brzezinski. I mean, he sees things 
that we don't see. He wrote a piece about five years ago in which he said the situation in Mexico was dangerous because there were several dilemmas fusing um, with a continuing confusion. Well, that's a hell of a connection, I mean. If you, you really worry about what's going to happen when they come together. It could be like a nuclear fusion, you know, or explosion. And he had his picture taken in Afghanistan. I guess he'd read Kipling. He was there with a gun, you know, looking up and said, there is the Khyber Pass. And the communists may come through the Khyber Pass. And also, they said that the Af Afghanistan was squarely astride the the uh, trade route that was taken by Marco Polo. Now that's the kind of historical stuff you want to know about and don't let it happen again. <laughs> and they feed us this stuff, you know, and, and the press prints it say Afghanistan is firmly astride the trade route followed by Marco Polo. And you say, send Dan Rather over. I mean, Dan will, Dan will clear the way. <laughs> It, it, it just kind of runs on, you know, and you, you, you get almost get tired kind of pointing out the obvious, but you can't quit. Yeah. Senator McGovern was, was saying that we were never the enemies to the Vietnamese people. Even now, uh, a lot of my friends have been back to Vietnam. Talk uniformly about how much the Vietnamese like Americans, which I must say with a little pain still amazes me. Um, in, 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 all of them have told me, a number of them have told me, the most important phrase to learn when you go back, Bill, is the phrase that says, I am not a Russian, I'm an American. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Sir. My name is Broadnax Robertson. Is it on? My name is Broadnax Robertson. I was a former student at the college. I'm a retired a high school government and history teacher. I just have a brief comment, having attended all of the sessions here, hearing the different viewpoints, that we are looking at this uh, from the vantage point of a Monday morning quarterback. And particularly um, with uh, the domino theory, the fear that Ho Chi Minh, backed by the Chinese, uh, that if he had no opposition in South Vietnam, might continue along with invading and trying to take over adjoining countries. So we can say now that this was a foolish uh, thought and a foolish theory, but at the time, uh, maybe it wasn't so foolish. So would you gentlemen care to make a comment on that? The comment was that uh, Monday morning quarterbacking is uh, marvelously uh, uh, accurate. We, we know now what did not work, uh, but uh, were we so certain uh, of uh, those things at the time events were uh, transpiring? Well, I think the burden is on those who said what was going to happen and didn't happen. You don't have to prove anything really good if you were negative, but when you had McNamara saying, we'll have the boys home for Christmas, you say, where were they at Christmas? I didn't say they weren't going to get home at Christmas. You said they were going to get home at Christmas. So I don't have to justify your mistake. And that applies pretty much generally to the whole Vietnam thing. We, we were really not second guessing. They, they really ran out their course. And the things they said would happen didn't happen. So you say, you explain why they didn't happen. We just say they didn't happen. And I guess in some cases we said they wouldn't happen. But it was the person who projected the domino theory and it didn't work. You say, why didn't it work? Uh, it was your theory. Or the, the, the people who said the thing about the Space Defense Initiative having discouraged the Russians. We find out that the Russians knew it wasn't working. So we don't come along and say, you know, it didn't work because we said it wasn't going to work. It, it just didn't work. And the burden really of proof in, in this case is is I know an old historian who said, you know, don't ask me why things happened or what would have happened. It's hard enough to find out what did. <laughs> well, and I think the other thing is that throughout the Vietnam War, uh, while the game was still on, to use your metaphor, uh, there were a lot of us saying, no, you're wrong. Uh, this will not happen. That will not happen. We do not need to be at war with these people. Um, I think events have, have borne that out. That wasn't Monday morning quarterbacking. That was another point of view during the game. <laughs>
I think, I think it is true that you can see things in, in hindsight that you didn't see quite as clearly at the uh, time. But uh, even today, looking at the uh, results of that war, uh, I, I think I'd have to tell you I feel more strongly now that it was a, a mistake even than I did at the time, and I thought it was a dreadful mistake then. Let me just cite one example of what I'm talking about. One of the worst things that followed the uh, Vietnam War was the tragedy in Cambodia where uh, Paul Pot uh, killed probably two million people in his own country. He was killing Cambodians. Now, the implication of the domino theory people is that uh, that's because the communists won the war in Vietnam that somehow Pol Pot was an instrument of the uh, Vietnamese, whereas the facts are that just the reverse is true. He hated the Vietnamese, communists, non-communists uh, alike, and uh, after killing two million of his own people following the war uh, in Vietnam, who was it that finally put an end to that? It was the Vietnamese. Why? Because some of their people were among the two million being killed. But this was not an extension of Vietnamese communist power that killed those people in, in Cambodia. It, it was the military power of the Vietnamese that finally intervened, drove Pol Pot out of uh, office, and stopped the killing. I think uh, half or more of the people of Cambodia would have been eliminated had it not been for the uh, Vietnamese army. Now, in due course, uh, the Vietnamese uh, withdrew, withdrew peacefully. Now we've had an election, and we're trying to get the results of that election uh, accepted. The Vietnamese are all for the election. It's the Pol Pot group that's still trying to sabotage that election. But uh, the regrettable thing about all this is that during the war, we had... Uh, uh, Prince Sihanouk in charge of Cambodia. He was a somewhat pro-American, kind of moderate type, uh, benevolent uh, dictator that pretty well kept things in hand. He didn't want to go to war with anybody, with us, with the Russians, the Chinese, the Vietnamese. He just wanted to keep peace. Unfortunately, the American uh, bombing campaigns against Cambodia, supposedly looking for Viet Cong, who had fled across the border, just about destroyed Cambodia. It was illegal. It was concealed from the Congress, from the American public, but it went on for about a year and a half, massive bombarding of that, of that little country. And that's what brought down Prince Sihanouk and opened the way eventually for Pol Pot to take over, one of the worst uh, murdering thugs uh, that's ever come to power uh, anywhere in the world. It's not the domino theory, as Gene says, it's the domino theory in the reverse. It was the big domino, the Vietnamese, that tried to put an end to that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry we are out of time. I, I want to make some suggestions to you military theorists that someone ought to develop a, a kind of an explanation of the theory of the, immor of the amorality of bombing. That if you bomb, it doesn't count against you. This is sort of free play. You know, you just drop the bombs and gravity takes care of it. So you can sort of blame it on nature. But we talk about bombing, we say, why don't we just bomb them, you know? It's like the first catapult that threw a rock over the wall. So I didn't name it at anybody. <laughs> just, they just got in the way of it. Of course, this wasn't true with us bombers in World War II. We always, uh, we always hit the target right on the head. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to thank in particular the uh, panelists uh, today for a most informative and enjoyable, if that's the right word, uh, panel. <laughs>
I, I do have second doubts now about continuing my profession as an historian. Yeah. I do want to encourage you to attend the, the final session of this symposium this evening at 7.30 when Vietnam veterans and friends will give us again their thoughts in music and word of their memories of Vietnam. I wish also to thank all of the participants at this symposium uh, for being here and giving us their insights, their emotions about what has, what did transpire. I would also like to thank those of you in the audience who have come and asked your questions. I think the questions have been amazingly perceptive. Uh, I, I think that demonstrates the continuing interest uh, in Vietnam uh, by all parties and all generations. You have heard here over the last three days the voices of the war. And there have been many calls to you to learn from them each voice offering an experience, a perspective that is worth listening to, that speaks to this tragedy we call Vietnam. Last Tuesday evening, Ron Reidenauer, the soldier who broke the My Lai incident, said that there can be no healing until the disease is cured. There can be no learning until we disabuse ourselves of prejudice and narrow-mindedness and ethnocentricity. That is what took us into Vietnam, and that, I think, is what, to a certain extent,